When an off-duty Alaska Airlines pilot tried to sabotage a passenger plane's engines in flight this week, it took less than 24 hours for us to learn that the pilot had recently taken shrooms. He was allegedly high out of his mind when he attempted to activate the fire suppression system on the engines, according to officials. Authorities released that information for obvious reasons. For one thing, you know, they wanted to assure the public that this incident was not part of some broader terrorist plot, given the events in the Middle East. And more importantly, the authorities understood that they needed to provide some kind of explanation for why an Alaska Airlines pilot would decide out of the blue to try to kill 83 passengers on one of his company's planes. After all, when a senseless act of attempted mass murder happens, the news media and the American public uh, are usually very interested in the details. They want to know, for example, what drugs were in the system of the would-be killer. And in the case of the Alaska pilot, those details were provided right away. Uh, even in an incident, in this case, where nobody died, we got some transparency and we got it immediately, as should be the case. And all that makes sense. What doesn't make sense, by contrast, is how the media has reported on Robert Card, the 40-year-old petroleum specialist in the U.S. Army Reserve, who, according to authorities, just went on a shooting rampage in Maine. Card allegedly killed 18 people at a bowling alley and a bar. He wounded many others. And here's how various news organizations described Card's potential motivations. Watch. We have more breaking news regarding the mental health history of the man suspected of killing 18 people in Maine. I want to bring in Ken Delaney and NBC News Justice and Intelligence correspondent. Ken, what have you just learned? Chris, it's become increasingly clear that there were major concerns about this suspect, Robert Card's mental health over the summer and as recently as a few weeks ago, both from his military commanders and members of his family. I've got two pieces of information to share with you. Two senior law enforcement officials tell me that Card's Army Reserve commanders referred him to inpatient psychiatric treatment over the summer after they be became concerned about his comments that he had been hearing voices and about threats that he had made to the base. And we're told that he spent about two weeks inside a psychiatric facility, was treated there, was released. It's unclear what happened after that. He's a firearms instructor and is known to have mental health issues. Uh, particularly had reported hearing voices in his head, had previously threatened to shoot up a military base before, and as recently as this summer, spent two weeks in a mental health facility, then was released. Now, those details there are going to raise all sorts of questions and red flags as to how he's got that rifle that he's holding in these photos right now. With those kind of mental health issues, going into a mental health facility this summer. Uh, there are going to be all sorts of questions asked as to how this guy was able to possess a firearm like that. If we look at the suspect, Robert Card, certified firearms instructor, member of the U.S. Army Reserve, made threats to carry out a shooting at National Guard facility earlier on, according to authorities, and reporting mental health issues, including hearing voices. If you look at all of that, you combine it with that information you just reported there, the idea that this is somebody who may know the outdoors very well, who may be very skilled at this, you understand how this uh, shooting, this really changes the approach that law enforcement has to take to him. So Robert Card, all these news outlets tell us, suffered from serious mental health problems. There were major concerns. He was inpatient at a psychiatric facility just this summer for at least two weeks. Everyone from his military commanders to his family knew about this, and therefore these outlets, all of them, including Fox, CNN, MSNBC, have the same question, such as, um, how was he able to access firearms? The laws in place are already supposed to prevent somebody like Card from having guns, so why weren't those laws followed or enforced? And those are very good questions. They need to be answered. We also need to know why Robert Card was ever released from that inpatient psychiatric facility, especially when the U.S. military apparently knew that he wanted to shoot up the base. Several commentators have raised that question as well. But there's another question that is important to ask, which none of these media outlets have been talking about. It's the same question that the media answered very quickly in the case of the Alaska Airlines pilot, which is, what drugs exactly were in the shooter's system? And along those same lines, what drugs has he been taking recently? So if he was hearing voices in his head and talking about suicide... There's a good chance that he was on antipsychotic medication. He might have been on SSRIs as well. Could those drugs have made him even more violent than he already was? These are questions that most of the national news media actively discourage you from asking. You're called a conspiracy theorist if you try to bring up this topic. 
In fact, you'll probably be censored on major social media platforms. Earlier this year, for example, USA Today ran a fact check claiming that antidepressants are not linked to school shootings. And if you try to claim otherwise on Facebook, there's a good chance that USA Today's fact check will appear alongside your post. So what's the evidence that antidepressants are not, in fact, linked to school shootings? Well, as part of this fact check, USA Today linked to a study from Columbia University on mass shootings. And here's what the study found. Quote, we identified... 1,315 mass murders, 65% of which involved firearms. Lifetime psychotic symptoms were noted among 11% of perpetrators. These results suggest that policies aimed at preventing mass shootings by focusing on serious mental illness characterized by psychotic symptoms may have limited impact. Now, if you just read those statistics and accept the framing of USA Today and Columbia University, they're pretty convincing. You might come away with the idea that psychoactive drugs can't possibly be causing mass shootings since only 11% of the perpetrators have lifetime psychotic symptoms. Therefore, you know, there's a good chance that many of them are not taking SSRIs and other medications. But if you read the fine print, you might notice something that explains these figures. Here's how Columbia defines a mass shooting. Quote, the unlawful killing of four or more individuals excluding the perpetrators within one event in one location. In other words, gang violence counts. Drive-by shootings targeting rival drug dealers count, etc. So what we're seeing here is a statistical sleight of hand. You know, of course, we should be doing everything we possibly can to stop mass shootings, as Columbia University defines them. We should enforce laws that are already on the books. We should stop releasing criminals as soon as they're arrested. Um, at the same time, the fact that all these mass shootings are occurring in the absence of SSRIs doesn't tell us anything whatsoever about the role of psychoactive drugs in causing violent behavior. Columbia's researchers don't address the core question. How many people who aren't gangbangers, who aren't career criminals, are taking SSRIs and then going on to commit mass shootings that they would not have committed otherwise? Now, not too long ago, some media outlets were willing to broach that question. Here's the BBC, for example, in a report that aired seven years ago. Watch. I was an absolute mess, wanting to take my life, like, continually. I got, I read the leaflet and I was getting exactly what it said, you know, I was getting kind of seizure-like symptoms where um, my muscles were kind of jolting around of their own accord and I felt disorientated and sick and had digestive problems and infections and I mean it's really really extreme. One in four people become more anxious rather than less and they can become extraordinarily anxious so that some people become very agitated and some go on from that to become suicidal. Okay, so roughly a quarter of people taking these drugs, according to that report, are actually experiencing increased agitation. It's not just that the drug failed to solve their problem, the drug actively made their problem worse. Now, none of this is really a revelation. If you look at the labels on these drugs, you'll often find that drug companies come right out and admit it. So here's the label of Prozac, word for word. Quote, all patients being treated with antidepressants for any indication should be um, monitored appropriately and observed closely for clinical worsening suicidality, and unusual changes in behavior. The following symptoms, anxiety, agitation, panic attacks, insomnia, irritability, hostility, aggressiveness, impulsivity, and mania have been reported in adult and pediatric patients being treated with antidepressants for major depressive disorder, as well as for other indications. The label goes on to say that no causal link has been established between these symptoms and the drug, but it obviously doesn't rule it out. That's why they put it on the label. Okay, and if you look at recent mass shootings going, going back for the past few decades, you begin to see why they put it on the label. Antidepressants, as well as other psychoactive drugs, have been a common denominator in many of these killings. Too many to even recount, but we'll recount a few of them. Eric Harris, one of the Columbine shooters, was taking two separate SSRIs, uh, Zoloft and Luvox. Kip Kinkle, who murdered his parents before shooting 25 of his classmates, killing two of them, was taking Prozac, which is another SSRI. Jeff Weiss, the 16-year-old who murdered nine people in Minnesota, including his grandfather, before killing himself, was on Prozac. One of his family members told the New York Times, quote, they kept upping the dose for him, and by the end, he was taking three of the 20-milligram pills a day. 
I can't help but think it was too much, that it must have set him off. Another relative said, quote, I do wonder whether on top of everything else he had going on in his life, on top of all the other problems, whether the drugs could have been the final straw. A 27-year-old who killed six people at Northern Illinois University in 2008 was reportedly on Prozac as well. So was Joseph West Westbecker. In 1989, he killed eight co-workers at a printing plant in Kentucky while taking the antidepressant. In 2001, Christopher Pittman was taking Zoloft when he killed his grandparents. And at trial, his lawyers blamed the drug. Kenneth Seguin's lawyers uh, made a similar argument. He brutally murdered his wife and two children after his doctor prescribed him Prozac. Now, I could go on and on and list dozens of other examples. The Navy Yard shooter in 2013, Aaron Alex. Alexis was, uh, was on antidepressants. James Holmes, who shot 82 people in that movie theater in Aurora, Colorado, was on Zoloft. Dylan Roof, the white supremacist church shooter, was on SSRIs as well. Um, the trans-identified shooter who killed men, women, and children at the Christian school in Tennessee this year was under care for a, quote, emotional disorder. But you're not allowed to know any details about that. You're also not allowed to read the killer's manifesto in that case. A couple of months ago, a, a mental health watchdog called the Citizens Commission on Human Rights pointed out that the mass shooter at a Kentucky bank who killed five people and wounded many others was taking medication for depression. The group called for an investigation into possible links between psychoactive drugs and, quote, senseless violence. But no investigation would be forthcoming, of course. Corporate media organizations have no incentive to undertake any kind of investigation like that because they make hundreds of millions of dollars a year from Big Pharma. And honestly, they may not be the only ones who are being paid off. Nobody ever talks about this, but a couple of years ago, it emerged that Eli Lilly, which makes Prozac, was accused of, of uh, paying money to the victims of a mass shooting in order to protect their brand. Quoting from the USA Today, uh, quote, the drug maker that produces Prozac, the antidepressant that Joseph Westbecker's victims blamed for his deadly shooting rampage 30 years ago, secretly paid the victims $20 million to help ensure a verdict exonerating the drug company. Indianapolis-based Eli Lilly vigorously shielded the payments for more than two decades, defying a Louisville judge who fought to reveal it because he said it swayed the jury's verdict. Now, was there a link between Prozac and that deadly rampage? We can't say. Seems like the company was worried that there might be. We do know two things for sure. First, the most powerful forces in media and big pharma do not want you to ask these kinds of questions. And second, we know that a lot of people who are taking these drugs are killing people in ways that are utterly horrifying. These are not just mass shooters either. The Daily Wire just reported on the case of a Massachusetts mother who methodically strangled her three children, including a five-year-old, a three-year-old, and an eight-month-old, uh, to death before trying to kill herself. She took four minutes to complete each murder. She strangled each of them with an exercise band. Then she cut her own throat and jumped out the window. Now, according to the women's, woman's lawyers, uh, she, quote, suffered from postpartum depression and was overprescribed medicine. Now, this is the kind of crime that demands an explanation. Why in God's name would a mother, seemingly normal and law-abiding until that moment, suddenly decide to methodically murder all of her children. Postpartum depression is not an explanation. That's what the media has been telling. Oh, she has postpartum depression. Okay, lots of women get postpartum depression. Almost none of them have ever done or would ever do something like that. This mother did. Why? We need to know why. At this point, inevitably, some people will point out that correlation is not causation. That's true. You know, the fact that a bunch of people on SSRIs and other drugs like Ritalin are committing mass killings does not necessarily prove that these drugs are causing those killings, but it certainly suggests that it's a possibility. The drug makers themselves acknowledge that it's a possibility. And every effort to debunk this hypothesis has been misleading at best and fraudulent at worst. Drug makers are being accused of paying off victims. Corporate media outlets are burying the statistics by citing gang killings. Meanwhile, the bodies are piling up. You know, as much as leftists dream of solving this problem by seizing all the guns and jailing everybody who believes in the Second Amendment, that's not going to happen. I mean, there would be bloodshed on a scale never seen before in human history if the government attempted anything like that. So there's really only one option that could potentially save lives instead of bringing down the entirety of our constitutional republic. And that option is to determine conclusively why mass shootings and suicides are becoming more common 
over the past few decades, during which SSRI, SSRI use has soared by roughly 3,000%. It was just a couple of years ago that the pharmaceutical industry admitted that it has no idea how these SSRIs are even supposed to work. Their basis for prescribing them, the chemical imbalance in the brain bit, that was a myth. And that has been admitted. So, so what that means is that the people giving these drugs to people, they don't even know exactly how they work or why they work or if they do. So you would think that everybody would welcome an investigation into this. If you have these drugs that more and more people are taking, and at the same time, more and more violent, uh, heinous crimes like these are being committed, you would think that lots of people would be asking questions. But right now, no one seemingly is asking the question. They're just talking about new laws to take away people's guns, even though Maine already had a so-called yellow flag law that should have ensured Robert Card didn't have access to firearms, but he did. They're offering non-solutions that will expand their power while limiting your rights. They're confident about their ideas, even though none of them has done anything to stop mass shooting since Columbine. They've only become more common. So maybe it's time for a new approach. Maybe it's time for the one solution they don't want you to talk about, which is investigating what role psychoactive drugs are playing in these killings. Now, I don't know what that investigation might find. All I know is that as more and more people are put on the psychotropic drugs, we seem to end up with more and more psychotic mass killers. At a minimum, this would indicate, it would seem, that the drugs are not effective in stopping these tragedies from occurring. Best case for the drug makers is that they're pushing an ineffective product. Worst case, and a very plausible case, is that they're pushing something that is actively contributing to the very thing it's supposed to prevent. We don't know for sure because very few people are interested in finding out. What I do know is that if any real investigation ever took place, then Big Pharma and its media clients would stand to lose a lot of money. And for that reason, there will be no investigation. Instead, there will be a lot more Robert Cards and Dylan Roofs and Kip Kinkles. And when you tune in to the NFL or Fox News or CNN, You'll continue to be bombarded with advertisements from the companies that were prescribing those killers their medications. The media will continue to make money on both ends. They get the ratings from their breaking coverage of mass shootings, and they get the ad dollars from Big Pharma. And unfortunately for people in bowling alleys and bars and schools all over the country, the cycle will continue. If you'd like to see what else I have to say, you can access my full show by going to dailywire.com or by going to the Matt Wall Show Twitter page. Hope to see you there. Godspeed.